Our first scripture lesson is from the Hebrew Bible, from the book of Genesis, chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. It's the famous story of that tower built to heaven. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar, and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore it was called Babel, and because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. And the second lesson comes from the New Testament, from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Chapter 5, verses 16 to 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we, were once, we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we now know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation, and everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin and knew who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. May these words be blessed to our understanding. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be ever acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. As Barclay just so well noted, the COVID pandemic has taught us many lessons. We have painfully learned that this most highly sophisticated and technological of civilizations, indeed in history, can be laid low by a tiny virus. But we've also seen what fact-based science can do. That creativity Barclay talked about that has brought us in record time vaccines that are effective against this new menace. However, I think the most important lesson has been the realization of the need for others in our lives. I have achingly missed hugging my grandchildren and sharing time in person with family and friends. It just hasn't been there. Zoom and FaceTime have been newly appreciated godsends, but they aren't the same as being there in person. We've also 
been pointedly reminded that we are profoundly interconnected. As Martin Luther King Jr. said years ago, all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one affects all indirectly. If I don't socially distance, wear my mask, or get vaccinated, not only am I affecting myself, but I'm also affecting countless others, and vice versa. We need each other, and indeed, we are better when we are with others in a relationship. Frankly, we cannot long survive without each other, and yet we are often today profoundly divided from one another. And as Lincoln said, a house divided cannot long endure. So it is that I want to talk with you about reconciliation. It's an unusual word, one we don't often use. Reconciliation is that process of making combat compatible, of bringing several things into harmony. The concept is at the heart of the New Testament lesson we just heard. After Pentecost, the early church was split. Was the message of Jesus Christ solely for the Jewish community from which Jesus and most of the disciples had come? Or was the message of the cross intended for all people? This dispute, frankly, seems largely irrelevant to us in this day but it was deadly serious to those who lived in the aftermath of Jesus' death and resurrection. The future of the church hung on it. It was against this background that Paul wrote to the early churches. To them, Paul proclaimed that it was God's purpose through Jesus to break down the walls that separate us, the barriers, the walls of ill will and hostility between Jew and Gentile. Through Jesus, Jew and Greek, slave and free, rich and poor, woman and man, were made one. All sins were forgiven and all people were reconciled with God. Regardless of our differences and imperfections, God accepts us for who we are, beloved children of God, knowing that we, what we can become if we follow Jesus. And Jesus was the ultimate embodiment of reconciliation. Through him, we are accepted without condition and without having to earn it. Of course, that is not the end, but a new beginning in our relationship with God. The risen Christ challenges us to become the best we can become as beloved children of God, forgiven and made new. It's not, however, just the barriers, the walls between God and us that have been broken down through Jesus. The barriers that separate us one from another have been broken down as well. Jesus, the one who ate with prostitutes and tax collectors, proclaims that our imperfections and differences accepted by God must not separate us one from another. We are all equal in God's eyes and equal in God's forgiveness and love. And that transcends our differences of culture, language, ethnicity, race, gender, sexual orientation, and political and social view. Who are we to erect barriers between us when God has torn them down? On Memorial Day 38 years ago, I got up at 5 a.m. and went to the newly opened Vietnam War Memorial, picture up there, for the first time. I was worried that I'd lost sight of the meaning of Memorial Day, that it wasn't just about sales and parades and so on. Um, and I wanted to see the new memorial without crowds. Those of you who have seen it, I hope will agree that this memorial is deeply moving. That long, simple, angled wall of polished granite is etched with the names of 
more than 58,000 men and women who lost their lives in that war. Yet it is more than just a memorial, but it's an embodiment of reconciliation, of a belated acceptance of those who served in that war. The Vietnam War has been superseded in our collective consciousness by more recent conflicts, Iraq, Afghanistan. For my generation, it was, however, one of those defining events, right up there with the civil rights struggles, the assassinations of, of the Kennedys and Dr. King. Members of my generation were either dove or hawk, that is, either passionately opposed to the war as morally wrong, or wholeheartedly in support of it as a national responsibility. There were few who were neutral. Feelings ran very high. Many took to the streets to demonstrate against the war and others to demonstrate in support of our government's decision to send troops. The depth of the feelings and differences over the war were reflected in the reception given to those who served. After they returned, these veterans were generally ignored, sometimes stigmatized and frequently shunned. Many continue to bear the marks of their icy and often painful reception. Surprisingly, this simple memorial has had the effect of serving to reconcile those holding different views about the war. By simply naming those who died, the Vietnam Memorial reminds all of us, whether pro or anti-war, that there is something that transcends our differing political views. The memorial helps us to remember that we are all connected by the common sacrifice represented by the names of those men and women listed on that black wall. While we may still be in pro or anti-war camps, there is a recognition that when one looks at the mirror, at that wall, mirroring back every face that looks at it, we are reminded of a common bond among all of God's people. That experience serves to break down those barriers of difference. What the memorial said to me 38 years ago and continues to say is, who are we to erect barriers between us when God has torn them down? But let's not kid ourselves. Reconciliation is hard and never fully finished. Not far from the Vietnam Memorial stands the Lincoln Memorial. I stopped there too on that morning many years ago. On one of its walls is written perhaps the most eloquent statement of reconciliation in the English language. It's Lincoln's second inaugural address. On March 4th, 1865, the Civil War, our bloodiest in history, was nearly over. In the North, the feelings of loss and pain were great, matched only by the demand for swift and harsh punishment of the South. In reply, Lincoln spoke of reconciliation, with malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. As Lincoln so eloquently pointed out, both North and South had grievously suffered and that transcended the deep differences between them more importantly, he reminded all of us, then and now, that reconciliation can never be premised on punishing another, gaining satisfaction, or getting even. Rather, it demands unconditional acceptance of the divine goodness of all creation. Who are we to erect barriers between us when God has torn them down? This message of reconciliation is important for our individual lives. Who among us has not suffered or, or does not suffer from the pain of estrangement from a friend or a loved one? We live in a world which places great strains on relationships. 
We're pulled in our personal and public lives in many directions by conflicting demands of career and family, by conflicting roles we are asked to play, and by conflicting and often difficult moral, social, and political issues which we face and which often separate us. These demands place strains on each of us and in turn on our relationships. And of course there's little time to slow down and depressurize. Paul's call for reconciliation teaches us what we must do. We must accept our own imperfections, recognize the limits on our own ability to see what is right and acknowledge the difficulty of knowing and acting on what God asks of us. Finally, we must accept these very limits in our friends and loved ones, and yes, even strangers at times. Why? Because God has. Sounds seductively simple, but it's not. We're challenged to love one another as God loves us, even when the other is selfish, insensitive, unreasonably certain, and yes, disagreeable. That is not easy, but it is important for us and our nation. For who are we to erect barriers between each other when God has torn them down? That is precisely what it means to be, as Paul said, in Christ. Last Monday, we recognized the sacrifices so many have made to preserve this union founded on these highest of ideals, liberty, pursuit of happiness, equality, freedom of expression, justice for all, and democracy. It is painful that at this time in our history we are perhaps as divided as we have been at any time since the Civil War. We're identified as living in a red state or a blue one, not in the United States. Too many live in political silos, listening only to their favorite news outlet because it alone speaks the truth. Civil discussion and debate seem endangered species. Those proposing an initiative on a controversial subject um, risk being subject to threats and character assassination. Is there any doubt we need reconciliation, a state of respectful tolerance that accepts that we do not agree on every issue, but we are indeed all beloved children of God. Reconciliation recognizes that the other, the one with whom we most passionately disagree, is also a child of God. Reconciliation recognizes that none of us is always right. It requires humility and it requires accepting that people grow and evolve and should never be utterly canceled, shunned, or ignored because of a mistake. It understands that redemption is always possible. As our scripture says, we are all ambassadors of reconciliation, challenged to knock down those barriers that separate us. Matters of faith and the direction of our nation are of deep importance to us and yet inevitably we don't see eye to eye on them. Communications can become strained, relationships can become frayed. It's been true in, in my life. What we have, however, is the clearest template for rebuilding and reaching out. God believes all creation is good. That means all of us. And so we start with that most fundamental and eternal reason for the acceptance of each other, namely that we are equally beloved children of God, who are we to erect these barriers between us when God has knocked them down? The poet Wordsworth wrote more than 275 years ago these words, God's inscrutable workmanship reconciles discordant elements and makes them cling together in one society. Let us continue to cling together here and elsewhere, remembering that God has torn down those barriers which separate us, so too should we. Let us reach out, talk respectfully with each other, 
commit to the pursuit of the facts and of the truth, and humbly listen to each other even when we disagree. To paraphrase an old song, a golden oldie, by the young bloods, come on people now, smile on your brother and your sister too. Everybody get together, try to love one another now. Amen. <laughs>